today we are continuing our series uh, talking about positive and negative emotions. And today we are focusing on this business of negative emotions, surviving the storms, overcoming the storms of negative emotions. I want you to know that uh, it is imperative, it is important, it is necessary to overcome negative emotions. Because if you do not overcome negative emotions, it will be difficult for you to see the beauty of God's world. It will be difficult for you to see and be happy. You need to be free to celebrate the beauty of life. Life is very beautiful. But sometimes we are blinded by negative emotions. We are hostaged by negative emotions. Some people are so bound by the chains of negative emotion that they are not able to even dance to the music of love, the music of faith, and the music of hope. That you're bound. You hear them complaining, arguing all the time, always trying to find some kind of fault. When will they ever stop to celebrate the beauty of life? It is difficult to do that, especially when you're bound, when you're in chains of negative emotion. You see, it is one thing for others to tie you down. You can fight your way out. But what happens when you tie yourself down? When you are your own worst hindrance? When you are the very one who is standing in the way of your progress? You say, how so? For example, time, talent, treasure, your temple, your temperament, those are the building blocks. Those are the tools with which to do anything successful in your life. But if you're not using any of those things in the worst, in the best state, then you're creating problems for yourself. As I say, it's one thing for people to hold you down, to tie you down. But what happens when you're holding yourself down and you're tying yourself down? And you say, how do you do that? Well, you tie yourself down by holding on to what? Something that is not good for you. You tie yourself down by holding on to some idea that is not good for you. You tie yourself down by holding on to some conditions that are not in your best interest. You tie yourself down by holding on to circumstances that you know are causing you destructiveness. You tie yourself down when you hold on to principles that are not helping you. They are hindering you. They're not helping you to grow. They're not helping you to succeed. They're not helping you to progress. You know these things are not good for you, good to you, but yeah, you don't want to give it up. You don't want to let it go. That's a form of holding yourself down, tying yourself down. Listen. People who succeed, people who achieve, people who progress, people who climb up the ladder of success are people who discovered what was holding them down and they decided to not let it hold them down, but to do something about it. For example, some people are bad when it comes to uh, uh, doing things on time. They procrastinate. They put it off. They put it off. They put it off. And sometimes they put it off so long that it becomes a situation where they're not even able to do anything about it because they keep putting it off. Well, in such an instance, 
if you're going to succeed, then you have to sit down and find out from people who overcame, find out what the principles, how do I overcome this hindrance called procrastination? You got to learn that. And the good news that I have for you this afternoon, don't be like those who think that they cannot change. Don't be like those who think that they cannot overcome. Don't be like those who think that whatever state, whatever condition they find themselves in, that's it for eternity. Oh, no. No, sir. No, ma'am. The good news is that you can change and go back to what God intended for you from the foundation of the world. From the foundation of the world, God said in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, 28, God said, let us make humankind in our image, in our likeness, and let them what? Be fruitful. Let's be successful. Let them multiply. That is to expand. Let them subdue. That is in your particular area. Be the absolute best. Let them replenish, give back. Don't just keep it to yourself. Give back to help somebody else. Have dominion. God made us managers, not slaves, but managers. Let's go back to that. But to go back to that, we have to agree that we will change, we will overcome negative emotions. That's the good news I have for you today, that you can change, you can overcome, and you can survive the storms of negative emotions. Let me say it again. You can change, you can overcome, you can survive the storms of negative emotions. Tell yourself that. Look yourself in the mirror. I can change. I can overcome. I can survive the storms of negative emotions. Yes, you can. It is necessary for you to overcome negative emotions. It is what? Imperative for you to overcome negative emotions. It is absolutely, I'm telling you, important. You see, what are some of the negative emotions we talked about? Sadness, anger, hate, jealousy, resentment, disgust. All of those things can stand in the way of your breakthrough, of your blessing. That's why Jesus said, forgive your enemies. Because if you fail to forgive your enemies, you are holding on to a negative emotion. And that negative emotion is going to stand in the way of God demonstrating his power on your behalf. Because God said, do not revenge, vengeance is mine, I will repay, said the Lord. So if you hold on to the anger, it will soon turn to hate. That hate turned to jealousy, resentment, disgust, and then before you know it, you want to do something bad to that person. And when you do bad to that person, you go down in history as one who did bad to another person, even though they were the one that instigated the problem. But because you're a child of God, because you've been born again, because you have the DNA of God working on the inside of you, you are supposed to be what? Giving it up. Someone is asking the question, what about grief? Yes, give it up. Work on it and give it up. Because as you're going to see in a few minutes, it, it stands in the way of your total worship your total praise of God. You see, grief is a form of emotion. And we all have grief at some point in time. The problem is when it becomes an overwhelming situation. You know, we shared with you earlier on that life is about moderation. We all get angry. But don't stay angry. 
We all experience grief. But don't stay in that department all the days of your life. Ask God, work on it to get out of it. Because it's going to stand in the way of your total worship, your total praise of God. As we're going to see in a few minutes, in Psalm number 37, verse 4, it says, delight thyself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, delight and desire are both feelings. They are feelings. They're not, you know, objective. Kind. They are your feelings. So if, for example, let's just use uh, what was asked about grief. If grief has overtaken, if grief has overwhelmed your emotions, then it is even difficult for you to be able to ask God to give you the power to overcome. That's why it's important if you're going to delight in the Lord, if you're going to desire the things of God, there are some things you have to let go. Now, I'm going to have to tell you in a few minutes, it's not just say it and it's gone. Well, you got to work at it. It's almost like your lawn. You don't cut your lawn one time and it stays like that. No. You got to keep cutting it. Keep cutting it. Every time it grows, you cut it down. Every time it grows, you cut it down. Every time it grows, you cut it down. And that's the way it is with negative emotions. Every time it rises up, you've got to put it down. That's why you have to have a coping mechanism, a strategy to deal with it when it comes up. Just like in our physical bodies, if we have a pain over here, we got a pain medicine over there, we got that alcohol over there, we have that rubbing, uh, whatever. In our emotions, we have to develop a strategy. When that sad feeling comes up, when that feeling of mournfulness comes up, what do I do? Maybe I put on some music. Maybe I read this chapter. Maybe I go out for a walk. Maybe I do this. Maybe I do that. But you've got to work at it. Don't sit down and let it overpower you. As we're going to see in a few minutes here. You can change. You can overcome. But you got to work at it. You've got to work at it. Anything in life worth having, you've got to work at it. You have to work at it until you get to the place where you look at it in the rearview mirror and it's not overpowering you. I hope that helps in the question as to what about grief? You see, grief is an emotion. And it's important to work at it because it can stand in the way of your total praise and your total worship of God. And it is God that you need to give you the strength to overcome. It is God that you need to give you the power to have the victory. You see, and the scripture says, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And so that's why you got to work at it. I don't want to give anybody the false impression that you can just wing your eyes and it's gone. No, you got to work at it. You got to work at it. Just like when you, you know, uh, 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 maybe fracture, injure, or break something on you. You go to the doctor. They treat you. They give you medication. But then afterwards, you have to go to rehabilitation to learn all over again how to walk, how to talk. The same it is with our emotions. Something happened. And because something happened, there was a sort of a decline in where we used to be. So how do we get back up there? We got to work at it. We got to work at it. We got to work at it. Yes. Because 
somewhere in the process, believe it or not, you will have to deal with how you feel about God, how you feel about others, how you feel about yourself. Sometimes, without even knowing it, we can become disgusted, angry with God, without even realizing it. I know of a situation where in this lady, I think I shared it with you before. Uh, she and her husband started off. They had just one room. That one room was their bedroom, was their living room, was their kitchen and everything. And then hmm, God began to bless them. God blessed them. They had properties. I mean, they had land. I mean, they were doing very, very well. Well known in the country. They were fabulously famous. And just about the time when they had begun to plan to live and enjoy life, then the ultimate happened. Death came into the picture. And that woman got angry with God. And for one whole year, she would have nothing to do with the things of God. When she left that funeral service, that was it. That was it. Her feelings toward God changed. Her attitude toward God changed. In other words, God, how can you let this happen to me? We're down, we're out, we didn't have it. Now here we are, we have it to enjoy, and you go take the man from me. What's up with that? Sometimes we ask, and we ask God those questions. God, do you know what you're doing? Hmm. If we are real with ourselves, we have to ask God because we cannot understand it. That's why it takes work. In order to change, in order to keep working at it, to overcome the storm of negative emotions, one must have, number one, a made-up mind. You got to make up your mind. I'm tired of seeing this grass growing Weed all in my yard. I'm tired of seeing it. I'm going to cut it. I'm going to cut it. Even if I don't cut it myself, I'm going to hire somebody to cut it. But I am not going to sit here and let my yard be taken over by grass and weeds, etc. I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to do something about it. I'm not going to sit here and let my car look all raggedy and, you know, uh, the, the bricks are squeaking all over the place and oil cannot be change because it's smoking all over the I'm not going to sit and let that happen I'm going to do something about it yes got to have a made up mind got to have a made up mind you've got to make up your mind and decide you know as I said there's a difference between option and decision you know option means you have alternatives when you decide there's no other alternative this is it for example, the four Hebrew boys, they decided, they told the king, we are not going to what? Bow down to your golden image. We will not. They decided. They said to the king, king, let me we'll tell you something. Even if God does not come through right now for us, we still will not bow down. They decided. Mm -hmm. Daniel. When the king passed a decree saying that no one should pray to any other God. <laughs> Daniel went home. He opened up his windows and what? He started praying. That's decision. So in order to overcome negative emotions, whatever they might be. Number one, you need to have a made up mind. As we shared with you, the prodigal son sitting there in that gutter, in that filth, in that dirt, about to eat the husk, the food, 
that he was feeding the swine. But the Bible says he came to himself. He made up his mind. I'm not going to sit here any longer and let this happen to me. I'm telling you, whoever you are, you can change, you can overcome. But you have to have what? A made up mind. You got to just get literally angry over the fact that your yard has been overtaken by weed and grass, etc. Either you cut it yourself or you hire somebody to do it. But you're not going to sit here another day and let this happen to you. And you see, when you make up your mind, when you make up your mind, the universe goes to work to begin to open doors, open avenues, and make things possible in your life. Once you make up your mind. The second thing we want to talk about today, it takes a positive, persistent attitude. As I said to all of us, nothing happens overnight. I don't want you to leave here and say, oh, yeah, this is going to happen. It's going to happen, but not overnight. You got to work at it. Let me share with you a passage of scripture and let you see what we mean about working at it. In the book of Mark, Mark chapter 2, beginning at verse 3, I want to show you something talking about working at it. It says here, and they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born by four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts with, Why does this man thus speak blasphemous? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, why reason you these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee? Or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk. But that you may know that the son of man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say to unto thee, arise, take up your bed and go your way to your house. When you look at this particular passage of scripture, you see elements of what we mean about working at it, being persistent. Never giving up. It's not going to happen overnight. But you keep working at it. The story is told about a gentleman who uh, wanted to work. And he searched. And searched. And searched. And saw a company that was hiring people. So he sent his application in. No answer. He sent another application in. No answer. He wanted to work at his place. And so what did he do? Every day, every day, he sent in an application to that place. For a whole year, every day, he sent in an application to that place. The people just... They said, this guy, he, he, something must be wrong with him. Let's call him in to come and see what is it about him and this company that he really want to work here. He want to work here. And they called him to come in. When he came in, he met the receptionist and he told the receptionist who he was. They said, oh, they're waiting for you. Come on in. 
when he got in there, they told him, your 300 plus application that you've been sending up in here is right here with us. Are you ready to start work today? And sure enough, he went to work. Persistence. So in this passage, we see the elements of persistence. You cannot give up. If you see a bright side, work, walk, run, whatever you have to do, get to that bright side. Let nothing stop you. If God has put it in your spirit, in your soul, to get to the other side, don't stop until you get there. Because that's where God is waiting on you. If you look at this passage of scripture, the four friends had good intentions. And what were their intentions? Their intention was to get their friend to Jesus because they had heard that Jesus is a healer. Jesus is a deliverer. Jesus gave sight to the blind. Jesus made the lame to walk. Jesus had turned water into wine. Jesus had done some major things. And so they said, if we can but get our friend to Jesus, we believe it's going to be all right. We believe it is going to be all right. And sure enough, that's exactly what they did. They got their friend. They took their friend to Jesus. They were very hopeful that when they got to Jesus, something was going to happen. Yes, they saw an opportunity for the transformation of their friend. They were tired of having to go all the time to visit their friend and he's there sick, lying, can't walk. Here is an opportunity for transformation. They got the man and took him to Jesus. But when they got there, guess what? They met obstacles. Let me tell you this, friends. When you are desirous of achieving a major goal, there will always be some setbacks, some disappointments, some heartaches, and they are all intended, listen to this now, they are basically intended to distract you, to change your mind, to change the course of your life. That's all they are, distractions. There are hindrances to stop you. There are obstacles to stand in your way. When these four friends got there, guess what? They were met with obstacles. And what were the obstacles? First of all, the crowd. In one translation, it says that you have so many people that even you couldn't get in at the door. They were everywhere. The crowd was an obstacle. And you know how sometimes people are. You can't say, well, excuse me, let me get this friend of ours to Jesus. They will say to you, well, we're trying to get to Jesus ourselves. We got our mama here to get to Jesus. We have our friend here. We have our father here. We have ourselves. We have people that we want to get to Jesus. And you tell them, excuse me. You excuse me. Excuse us. They were met with obstacles, the crowd. Then the construction of the house. There was no other door to get in. There was not a back door they could get in, a side door, none of that. So what did they decide to do? They decided to do what you may consider as civil disobedience. Civil disobedience. I mean, imagine someone coming to your house. You sit in your living room and you're hearing at the back somebody knocking your house trying to get in. They're not ringing the doorbell now. They're actually knocking the door down. These men with their friend, because of their persistence, 
They will not take their friend back home until he is healed. He will not go back home until he has encountered Jesus. We will not go back home until Jesus sees him and talks to him. That's our goal, that he will be healed. And sure enough, they went on top of the roof and they began to rip off the, the tile, the ceiling. And I mean, they ripped it off. That's how persistent they were. And the scripture says they let down their friend right before Jesus. Right before Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, you see, faith and persistence work hand in hand. If you say have faith, as Paul would say, then show it by your works. If you have faith, show it by your works. Don't just say, I have faith and something's going to happen. No, you got to work at it. When Jesus saw their faith, he saw the crowd that they couldn't come in through the front door. He saw that there was no side door for them to come in. But their faith moved them to what? Do the unusual. They went on top of the roof, tore it up, and let their friend down in the very presence of Jesus. And the scripture says, when Jesus saw their faith, Paul would say, faith without works is dead. If you say you have faith, then you got to show it by your works. Yes. When Jesus saw their faith, he first of all said to the man, the sick man, your sins are forgiven. You see, that's another subject matter all by itself. Our sins, if not confessed, can stand in the way of our healing, of our deliverance, of our breakthrough. So when you know you've done something wrong to God, nobody knows about it, just you and God, ask God to forgive you and God would do it. And so guess what? Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. And folks said, what is this? Who is he to forgive sins? And Jesus said, which is harder to say your sins be forgiven or to tell this man, get up, take your mat and walk. And Jesus told the man, get up, take your mat, go home. He was healed immediately. But his healing, his deliverance, his transformation, his breakthrough would not and could not have happened had it not been for his friends who were persistent. I say to you in closing, if you are going through some negative emotions, you have to, first of all, make up your mind and develop a strategy. Develop a strategy to what? To overcome. Hmm? Develop a strategy by which you can what? Overcome and survive. Those men had a strategy. Four of them, they went on the top, tore it off, let their friend down. You got to have a strategy. There'll be obstacles, but don't give up. And as I said, you got to deal with it because it can stand in the way of you and God and your breakthrough. Because the scripture says, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And delight and desire are both feelings. So I say to you today, whatever you do, make up your mind. Make up your mind. Develop a strategy to overcome and survive the emotional storm, the negative emotional storm in your life. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.